Okay, welcome back. We're going to get started now on the second panel. Uh, this is the tough part, overcoming the barriers to implementation. And uh, our panelists are going to discuss the problems facing research and business, businesses that are seeking to develop big data applications. Uh, this panel will be more of an open discussion than the last one. The last one were case studies, which needed a bit more time to be presented. But we want to have a very interactive dialogue here, so sharpen your pencils. Um, we'll have about three to five minutes of introduction from each speaker, and then we'll uh, go for the Q&A. So uh, we have another terrific lineup. I'll just introduce them from my left. Uh, next to me is John Wood. Secretary General of the Commonwealth Universities and also importantly co-chair of the Research Data Alliance Council. You'll hear more about that shortly. Uh, sitting next to him, Thierry van der Peel, Director in Charge of Excellence in Science at DG Connect at the European Com Commission. And then we have Kenny Simmon, uh, Vice President Janssen Infectious Diseases in the Early Research and Development Division at Janssen. And finally, last but not least, Sean Beavers, a senior lecturer in air quality modeling at King's College in London. Of course, uh, <clears throat> environmental, uh, environmental modeling is a huge area for big data. So <clears throat> I hope you all had a good coffee break. And without further ado, I'd like to give the floor to John Wood, who's going to give us an overview of the Research Data Alliance's aims and strategy. It's very much designed to overcome some of the basic obstacles to sharing data globally. John. Well, thank you very much indeed. Um, it's very difficult to follow the last session with so many exciting examples. I'm going to sound rather dry by comparison. Maybe it's just worth saying how I got into all of this. Um, uh, about 13 years ago, I took over the big labs in the UK, the big science labs, which churn out vast amount of data and receive vast amounts of data from CERN, from space, uh, and, and so on. And increasingly, what we were seeing happening was that we were moving away from single disciplines. So things like synchrotrons, the big X-ray sources, now on that machine, those machines that are, uh, there's 72 of them worldwide, biologists are there, environmental scientists are there, um, people looking after objects out of museums, prints from libraries and from old manuscripts, right through to basic physics and engineering. And they're all meeting together and sh starting to share ideas, and they're starting to share data. And it's quite interesting to see how these, um, the interoperability of these data sets from completely different disciplines was starting to emerge. And that's happening worldwide. Now, there's vast investment now in large-scale research infrastructures, of which data is an infrastructure. Uh, and we talked about co-laboratories. That's the sort of idea of this mass of sharing around the world. Now, you, you can either go hopelessly forward and hope everybody s arrives at the same spot, or you can do something about it. And there was a big meeting two years ago or so in Copenhagen uh, for big research infrastructures, trying to get them lined up so we don't have a 1,000 uh, things doing one thing when actually we only need three worldwide. Uh, and there are certain things in astronomy, there are certain things in uh, lasers, for instance, where you actually only need one or two in each region. So it's, it was all about that. And what became abundantly clear in that meeting, uh, the guy from National Science Foundation says, how are we going to make sure all the data starts to work together internationally? And over the last year or so, or maybe 18 months, we've had our umpteen meetings uh, where we've actually come to the point that about two and a half months ago, we launched the Research Data Alliance, which is a worldwide attempt to allow big data sets and small data sets to start to be interoperable. Now, this has been very much led by the US, by Europe, and I'm very pleased that uh, uh, Thierry's next door to me because his um, director general have been leaders in this in Europe and also in Australia, where they were ahead of the game. And they set up the Australian National Data Service ANS some years ago, and they started to realize how costly this thing was. So if you do it piecemeal, it becomes very, very costly indeed. Data, data storage and data sharing is not cheap. Um, and you do need to understand that. There's a real investment there. Somebody asked about the economies. We've got to build those models and actually look at what those, uh, those um, outputs are going to be. So uh, after all this work, then the Research Data Alliance was formed. Uh, I was nominated by the European Commission to represent Europe, and we're now looking for the second phase of people to come on board. There's a whole load of working groups. Um, I think there were 19 as of yesterday. 
And I was just telling some colleagues, the latest one is from the agricultural community who want to set up a, a database in wheat. Um, there were people looking at ocean currents. There were people looking at um, marine life. There's the big users, the astronomers that are coming on board. Their data sets will be so big that it will make CERN look like a home-brewed experiment. Um, and also in, in genomics, too, the Elixir project, they reckon they will run out of uh, storage space if Moore's laws um, um, uh, obey for the, in 2020. And they'll, they'll run out of world storage space. Um, and that's in the genomic area. And we heard a little bit about that earlier uh, from our friends um, from IBM and elsewhere. It, th things are really happening. And we've got to make this stuff interoperable. Now, it's all very well America, Australia, and the European community getting together. But what about the other countries of the world? They're starting to wake up now. And many of them are setting out um, data infrastructure roadmaps of how they move into this space. And uh, there's a G8 plus 5 meeting going on even as we speak uh, to try and get agreement on this. And that includes places like China, Japan, Mexico coming in as well, um, southern Africa, uh, Brazil, Canada, all coming on board. Now, the great thing is if we can make this work rather like the World Wide Web works, that will be fantastic. My only doubt is it could all go horribly wrong. Uh, and it will, you can have to shoot me because I'm going to be... Uh, representing Europe for you in this game. Um, the biggest problem we have, and I know we're going to talk about impediments soon, is linking up the computer scientists with the community that are going to use these data. That is one of the big issues that we have to face, that we get uh, a conversation going that isn't all about algorithms and things, which I don't understand a word, word of. Nigel might do, but I, I don't. Uh, uh, and I spent yesterday listening to a whole day's worth of, uh, of algorithm <laughs> development uh, and things like that. It's a very exciting time. Somebody was saying how fast it's all moving. I mean, uh, literally 19 of, or 20 of these groups have got going within six weeks. Fantastic. Very exciting. So if you could ma wave a magic wand and get rid of one obstacle, what would it be? I've got three obstacles down here. Okay. Um, <laughs> I think the biggest obstacle is actually in culture, if I'm perfectly honest. And I do actually think we need to get away from this idea, and I think it came up that maybe something that's right now is not necessarily right next week because things have changed. Um, I think this needs this, we need to start this data um, interoperability at primary school, actually, that we start to realize that there are not always right answers in these things. There is a, a changing dynamic. Uh, just in that, uh, when my children were doing school science in, in the UK system, it's GCSEs, they would come in because they, they knew I was a scientist. They said, Dad, we don't want to know what you think about this particular problem. We've got to learn the answers for the exam. Okay? <laughs> and they had school science and right science. And we've got to get back to right science, get to this imagination. And I think this thing about asking the right questions, uh, which Dan was talking about, is the key there, that we start asking the question. The question then is, how do you assess that? Or should you assess it? Because actually an assessment actually kills off the originality. Mm -hmm. But I, I could talk about publishers, and I could talk about academics, and a few other things that get in the way as well. OK. <laughs> if anyone has a question, I'll um, take one right now, just to kind of keep a oh, dialogue going. Anyone like to ask John a question about the Research Data Alliance and how it works? Um, it's um, it's rd-alliance.org, if you want to see it all. OK, great. Um, people are still... I'm going to ask a question. Okay, oh, good. Dwayne. Hi, John. Um, a quick question for you. I'm Dwayne from Science Business, for those of you who don't know me. How, how would you implement the procedures and policies that you guys design? How do you see that moving through the pipeline and actually having an impact? I think the great thing about the Research Data Alliance is bottom-up driven. So people who want to do it are going to do it. Uh, can I give you Wood's Law of Collaboration here, Dwayne? This is universal law, never been disproved. <laughs> it's only based on the academic community. I've been an academic in my life. One third of academics love working together. One third can be bribed through money, and one third will never work together. <laughs> Go with the third that's going to make it work. Well, what about the third who want to make money? Well, that, that's the EC problem. <laughs> <laughs> on that note, um, I'd like to uh, invite Thierry van der Peel to... Um, Give us a perspective from the commission on what you're doing to open up data sets to the public. Yeah. Thank you. I think uh, a lot was said already, uh, and I don't want to repeat. So let's say 
my role is largely on implementation now. We have two regulations directly related to data or to open access, let's say. The public sector information, which was uh, discussed and presented by uh, uh, Commissioner Nelly Cruz, which largely excludes education and science. And then we have the uh, package on scientific information, that is a communication of what the commu commission will, uh, will do and the recommendation, what we would recommend the member states to do, which is on scientific information proper. And here, it's very clear that the line which is promoted is open access to scientific information. Open access to scientific information has to be translated. So there are broadly two aspects. One is open access to publications, which is not the topic of today, but still relevant. And the other one is open access to data. And this is the tricky part at the moment. So the way we will implement, of course, the uh, scientific uh, information package is in Horizon 2020. It's public money. And it is expected that the benefit will go to society, but not only to society, also to business. So this is why it is pretty tricky to have uh, an open access policy. So what is being proposed in Horizon 2020, and this is under discussion, it's work, and I hope it's work in progress. So the first one is to make mandatory uh, open access to publication, so this is clear. On the data is actually to start what we did in FP7 on publications, that is to start with a pilot. The pilot on data would be the default option is all data coming out of Horizon 2020 projects should be made publicly uh, available, accessible, free of charge. Now, we would do a pilot precisely to see in which area we could implement this policy, bearing in mind that the challenge is to find the right balance between the legitimate interest of science, I mean, good science, trustable, and also uh, uh, being able to reuse the data, and the other aspect is we, and this is the red line, not to prevent any exploitation of results. Because Horizon 2020 is not only research, it is now research and innovation. So the business interests have to be protected. So it's very clear that we, the red line is not to prevent any exploitation of results. And we need precisely to experiment to do a pilot and the discussion on the pilot where is extremely relevant. Of course, the easy part of the pilot is to say for the upstream research, we will implement open access. This is the easy part. The most difficult part probably is where you have a strong participation of industrials in projects where you need to be more careful. Now, the way we would try to approach it is by asking every project to work out a data management plan upon which we would size the, uh, actually the pilot. So this is one element. Now, to support uh, the uh, policy on uh, open access, we need an infrastructure because it's fine to say data should be publicly available, accessible, mine, mineable, if I may say. You need an infrastructure to do that. And this is in this area, we would have a strong action in Horizon 2020 on the so-called e-infrastructure. So one aspect is on uh, uh, data repositories, uh, uh, data preservation, all the costs associated with that and the way to do it will have to be worked out, defining the standards, the metadata and everything to make them searchable, mineable and so on, and RDA in the, certainly in that context. The other aspect of infrastructure, which is also linked to data, is of course networking, so how to communicate data. So this is all our activities on uh, being leader in, in Europe, but worldwide now on uh, uh, research networking. And the third element is how to use these data. And we are shaping at the moment, it's being discussed in the council, uh, 
an initiative on high performance computing. And I may say that high performance computing is, uh, is not the right term because, I mean, basically it's not the computing really. What we are speaking about is data intensive applications. So, and this, in that policy, there will be a strong drive on uh, actually uh, defining uh, uh, new tools for data mining, uh, actually for data analytics. We need also, I mean, as, uh, as the, the, the type of architecture to, to exploit the data is uh, going towards a lot of parallelism. We need to rethink everything in terms of the way we, we, we design algorithms and methods. One element which is very tricky is by nature, e-infrastructure data is common across disciplines. And when we get the requests for support in Horizon 2020 or in FP7, it's usually very disciplinary. And of course, we do not want to reinvent the wheel every time. So the question is to have these various communities work together to find the leaders, to define what are the commonalities and not to repeat every time what one has already solved. I mean, this is the best, uh, uh, I mean, we need to argue the case. We are, by the way, forced to do that because, I mean, of shortage of money, everybody is looking at money. So it's very clear that we need to, be, to have a very rational approach and to avoid the application of services. So our structure in, uh, of the work program in e infrastructure will be very much, not so much to support the individual research communities, disciplinary communities, but to find the commonalities and the common services. Excellent, thank you. John, as part of your brief to make sure everyone doesn't reinvent the wheel or? Uh, well, not really. Um, there's no money involved in the RDA, by the way. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's self-generated. Um, and the key there is that, uh, you know, these groups have got... To, I mean, part of our job is to bring them together, obviously. Um, but uh, th what we're seeing is that's actually... Everybody wants to do that that's willing to take part. So, so far, we haven't had the problem of, of this going on. But I, I, I can see in, in due time there'll be groups that will start to close in and then we'll have to come in with the heavy boots or whatever to, to try and break it up. So Thierry, how long before we get a, a, a minimal e-infrastructure? What, what's your estimate? Well, uh, I think the, 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 the first element is, is uh, uh, certainly to link together the data repositories where, and I mean, at the moment, this work has been done uh, to a large extent for publications. I, I, Actually, we, we can see it and it's work in motion, if I may say. For data, it's not yet the case. And precisely, there are standards to be defined, metadata to make the data searchable, because uh, putting the data somewhere is easy, but to use it and to retrieve and to mine them is, is much more difficult. And this, I think, our expectation, I mean, uh, just by experience, I know that when you launch a policy, you need to wait uh, until the end of one framework program before you get something. So I hope this time would be faster, but uh, uh, as a matter of principle, I think uh, the real policy uh, uh, will be implemented, I think, I would say five to seven years. Now, we have to bear in mind, as uh, John said, that it is a change of culture for the researchers because they need also to be re rewarded for the data, for the work they do on data. And we need also to change part of the uh, fabric that is the citation. I mean, you can be cited for publications, but also for your data, which are being reused. So, and, and, and behind that, you have always the, 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 the promotion system in academia and uh, in research institutions. So I think it means a lot of, of changes which are important. And I think you don't change the mindset by regulation. You change it by doing. So it's not, by, it's, it's not really by law that you would force people to change. I mean, this will not work. I mean, especially as we are speaking about a global endeavor. It's not only Europe. Mm. Does anyone have a question on the policy side for Thierry right here? Wait for the mic. Thank you. Um, Professor Nelson from MNL Senior Pro Network. On policy side, but um, it's a comment regarding Horizon 2020. 
I told the European Commission that uh, Horizon 2020 shall necessarily fail as long as it relies on either arrogant, conventional, narrow-minded academics it doesn't have the guts to question, or on open but weak-minded academics who do not have the courage to make the bold, groundbreaking decisions that are necessary to innovate. Uh, three days later, I received um, an email from a senior officer at the European Commission inviting me to enroll. So, <laughs> and just to, um, I wanted to make this comment. Thank you. Provocative comment. Um, it's a complex issue. There's no question about it. Right. It, it, it's de facto complex because it's multi-stakeholders of different natures. So uh, uh, I think there is, a, uh, uh, I mean, first, it's not a, it has to be a European policy, but European policy doesn't mean a policy of the Commission. It's, a, it's basically, it is a, a common policy, at least in Europe, that we can work together along the same lines, which has been ac achieved uh, uh, in part through the discussions. And then it's much more now, it's, a, it's a, to be, I mean, uh, as I said, there are areas where it's easy to implement when you are upstream, but when we speak about medical data, pharmaceutical data, the discussion is m much more difficult. And but the problem is that um, if you don't use the mic, you don't oh, sorry. The video. <laughs> um, I'm the principal coordinator of projects uh, submitted to the European Commission. And um, the prob I told the, the Commission that um, we recognized um, the competence of evaluators to evaluate um, simple, straightforward projects. I once asked the Commission how you evaluate evaluators, but that we openly question um, the, the ability of alu evaluators to understand, let alone, or rather evaluate, or let alone understand complex avant-garde integrated interdisciplinary proposals. I mean, this is a, such a general question. I think the first principle is to have evaluators. I think uh, 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 the, 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 the fact that we are going through open calls and proposals which are evaluated by experts and not by bureaucrats, I think it's already something positive. Now, we can always shoot at evaluators. I mean, <laughs> we know that in every system, uh, 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 you have to select the right evaluators. What does it mean? I mean, the process is what it is. It is a process which is agreed by everybody and we are just implementing. We could change the system. The real question, on, I mean, what you say is, is the, 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 the consensus building which is the basis of our evaluation system. And when you base your evaluation through consensus, you probably do not take very high risks on some domains. And this we need to avoid because this is killing. I mean, at the end, if we take the average uh, proposals, we don't get innovation because by definition, innovation is something which is on the peak, not on the average. So this is the real question. But again, it's the choice of the evaluation and the, of evaluators and to find the right criteria behind it to be explicit. Okay, John, I think you well, wanted to take I a shot at that. But, but on this, prior to uh, this present role, I, I chaired the European Research Area Board, and we argued and argued and argued that more risk should be taken. The key is to go and see the parliamentarians, actually, about this, because they're voting the money, and they're putting the constraints on these guys about what risk will be accepted. So that's where you need to put your effort. Uh, uh, I mean, I said 60% of uh, European projects should fail horrors. But actually, we've got to get that mindset in if we're going to move forward. And, and, and the guys in the Commission know that. The guys who look at the bottom line don't know it. Okay, moving on. Uh, I'd like to give the floor to Kenny Simmon, Vice President of Janssen Infectious Diseases. Um, back to pharma, which holds a lot of rich uh, examples. Thank you, Gail, um, and thank you for um, stimulating discussions so far. Actually, let me just make a comment to the questioner from the floor straight away that actually I'm, I'm representing the pharmaceutical industry. I work for Johnson & Johnson, Janssen. I would actually beg to differ. I think the success of Horizon 2020 
does not just depend on my uh, colleagues here on the panel, the academic community, but it also rests upon involvement of citizens, patients, small, small enterprises and, and large companies like, like mine. So I think it's not just all about, it's not all about uh, academia. And I think to John's point about the reality check of being used to failure, well, welcome to my world, innovation in the pharmaceutical industry. Um, this is, uh, so let me make some introductory comments about, about pharma, um, and then I'll try and bring back uh, the two angles of uh, the, the contributions of technology and the impact that big data is having upon our, our, our corner of the healthcare ecosystem. So I think, uh, obviously, from a, from a pharma perspective, there's an enormous amount to be very proud of in the last 100 years, the benefits to, to, to mankind from vaccines, the, 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 the curbing of um, childhood diseases through vaccines, uh, innovations in cancer, in infectious diseases, um, the curtailing of the HIV pandemic, at least for, for those individuals in the West who are, have access to medicine and who can take their medicine that's transformed HIV from a life-threatening disease to a chronic condition if you have access to medicine. So we have a lot to be proud of, but there are enormous opportunities and huge challenges in front of us. Um, in addition to my role within uh, Janssen, I also have the privilege to sit on the research directors group of uh, FPA, the European Federation of Pharma Companies, and working very closely in the Innovative Medicines Initiative, which we haven't talked about today, which is a, an enormously successful and very large public-private partnership which was set up in 2008, 2009, with uh, 1 billion euros of, of Euro European taxpayers' money, matched with 1 billion euros of in-kind contributions from the pharmaceutical sector. This is an incredibly ambitious plan, and, and it's been actually, now we just see it beginning to bear fruit, and it's relevant because it's also being teed up as a, the PVP model for Horizon 2020, so IMI2, as the Thierry knows. So there's been a lot of discussion around what is it that we're going to do in, um, in the future. Well, we don't need to look far for medical need and opportunity. Uh, if you think about in Europe with uh, neurodegenerative diseases, the aging population, psychiatric disorders, respiratory infections, which we'll hear a little bit more of, I think, as well. There are many, many conditions which, which are awaiting uh, better treatment and better um, intervention and disease prevention and, and the maintenance of wellness. So there are, there are lots of opportunities, and one of the ways in which uh, the realization over the last decade for the companies has been that we cannot do this alone. As we heard this morning, most data lies outside of your four walls, and we are humble enough to realize that within uh, biomedicine also that the best ideas are, are ideas which are shared and are already in existence. So what is the, um, just to restate the challenge for, for pharma companies right now, the success rate for compounds entering the clinic to getting on the market is, is sitting around 5 or 6%. So that comes down to dynamics where it's around 10 years development, $1 billion investment, and a low chance of success. So these are pretty challenging targets for any industry. And so that is what has prompted um, the companies uh, and, uh, to, to enter things like IMI, or public-private partnerships, to share the risk in tackling these big, these big needs. Um, and I would say that big data and the advancement of the technologies in the last 10 years, the genome and the, the, the consequences of the, the implementation of omics technologies, the whole suite of technologies which are now at our disposal, uh, light up an amazing array of, of potential for us. Um, where does big data come into play? I think the traditional mechanism for, for drug approval, and so you were just talking about within the clinical trial drug approval context, has required a regulatory for companies to conduct clinical trials in, in consent with patients, with new medicines, and to go for randomized trials where you have um, a benefit over a risk, a safety, efficacy, an efficacy, safety benefit, and that's the regulatory framework. At the same time, in order to get reimbursement for drugs, we have to also meet the imperatives of the health, te health technology assessment agencies who are actually looking for something different. They're looking for evidence of relative effectiveness in the real world setting after approval. They're not interested in the clinical, well, they, they rest upon the clinical trial data, but really they want effectiveness data. And, and, and so they should, because it's our money as taxpayers that are going to contribute to the reimbursement of those drugs. So there we have these, these two, um, contrasting imperatives upon, upon uh, um, drug development programs within, within the, the space. 
And here's where big data and technology comes to play because with the advancement of real world mobile technology platforms, cell phones, um, smartphones, tablets, we can now already in pharmacovigilance monitor adverse events and there are some IMI initiatives which will look at this. So there's already this use of real world data to monitor real world effectiveness. And the challenge for us in industry now is can we also get move on with the technologies such that we can implement some of those technologies in real world into the regulatory framework. So in effect, we're trying to move the ship. We're trying to change the regulatory payer drug development and patient landscape all, with, all at the same time so that we can change the, the platform. And this is actually, the whole shift has been driven by the implementation, the availability of the technologies. And um, I, I'm very glad to say that the EMA, the FDA in the US, uh, Pharma in the US and FPA in Europe Everybody's now beginning to get together. There have been a number of meetings last year and this year in which everybody's now talking a common language and there are publications uh, in, in uh, Nature recently which are going towards how we're going to tackle this new regulatory payer framework. Um, there are some barriers to all of this which I'll come back to. I think well, I'll just tee up one of them straight away, which is, and, and John also mentioned this. I think absolutely imperative here is communication of the benefits, communication of the benefits and bringing the patients and the citizens with us. Because that's, if we don't do that, we'll fail and we probably deserve to fail. <coughs> that communication of benefits doesn't sound like a mission impossible. That sounds uh, doable. I, I hope so, yeah. Okay, any questions for Kenny from the audience? Okay. Hi, I'm Anja Smit. I'm from the Utrecht University in the Netherlands. And I'd like um, to ask a question. Of course, I understand that you are working with very confidential data. Still, I'm wondering uh, how open could the data be that your company is involved in creating uh, when working together with scientists? Sure, so there are, thank you for the question. There are different elements to the question. I, I, um, FBA and the companies were absolutely in favor of increased transparency. We're in favor of release of clinical data through the, e and we're working in conjunction with the European Medicines Agency to make sure that for drugs which are approved, there's access to data. And that's a, a discussion which is going on right now. I think with regard to open access to data, companies already, and, and ours included, we already have obligations um, to publish all clinical data and, and, and uh, only yesterday I was reviewing two manuscripts which are coming from my group on two studies which we have to get published. So this is an ongoing obligation. Um, within the constraints of the informed consent, which we always run for clinical trials, we are um, happy to put that data out. I think if you go beyond the clinical trial framework and ask a different question, and this is where um, some initiatives in, under IMI as a, as a neutral platform where we're bringing together multiple pharma companies within Europe uh, and multiple academic groups. Uh, there's a, there's a, an initiative which just starting this year called the European Medical Information Framework, EMIF, which is designed to be an overarching architecture of medical information to tap into all of that rich data on human health, which is existing in EHR records or um, in, in clinical registries. Um, two examples of where this is, where this is going. Um, we're looking at uh, both Alzheimer's disease progression. There are two specific programs which are being bolted on to the architectural framework. First one is to look at Alzheimer's disease pre predictors of progression. And the second one is to look for um, predictors um, of metabolic disorders, so in obesity and type 2 diabetes. Now, because this is all conducted under the IMI framework, all of the data, because you're paying for it we're, and we're contributing in kind, we're all paying for it, all of that data will be made public. So that is one of the central tenets of the Innovative Medicines Initiative, that when you commit to going into those programs, the data is public. So it's not, our, it's not company confidential data. So this is the change in landscape. There is a huge amount of pre-competitive work already going on, and, and that will increase exponentially over the next few years. And all of the data will be made available. Yes, here up front. <clears throat> Thank you very much indeed. It's John Parkinson from CBRD. Just interested in your views on adaptive clinical trials and adaptive licensing. So, indeed, the, the, the regulatory framework that I was referring to, the, which, were, which is the, the, the current framework, is based on um, fairly uh, 
principles which have been enshrined for the last few decades of which is just looking for benefits on efficacy over, over safety. The whole concept of, a, of adaptive licensing or progressive authorization is essentially that, and this is again driven by the technology, the application of new technologies into better understanding of disease classification. As we heard earlier, cancer is not cancer, there are 200 different types of cancer, so, and there are spectacular examples of drugs which, when you target the correct population, they work extremely well. So that's a perfect example of where the desire to move into smaller patient groups and get the initial indication. This is exactly the, 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 the discussion under, the, the topic under discussion right now with the EMA, FDA, and the pharmaceutical companies and patients. So we're big proponents of moving forward with adaptive licensing or progressive patient access. There are different terminologies which are being used. But again, this whole move is, under, the, the, the drive is underpinned by understanding disease classification, which is actually one of the uh, future um, key topics of the strategic research agenda under which Horizon 2020 or the uh, IMI2 will be driven um, is to understand better diseases and therefore we can target the right treatment for the right patient at the right time, which is everybody's ambition. And also for cost effectiveness, that's gotta be the best thing to do. And is big data vital to moving towards those smaller patient groups, but having obviously a, a wide population of them? To Absolutely, the big, the big data is essential and the real world data component. If one can bring real world data and bring the same and for the, for the efficiency of, the, of the, um, the process, if we can bring a single data package together, which will serve the imperatives of both the health technology assessments and the regulators, then our world, and I think your world would be a better place. And what's the main obstacle to that? Um, that's a cultural, that's a cultural historical, that maybe it's a, an element of turf. There are, there are different organizations representing health technology assessments. There are different regulatory groups. We need to take them on, a, on, a, on an EU-wide basis, on an, on a, actually on a global basis. So in all the discussions we have, the FDA and the EMA are both involved in. There's a lot of progress. There's a lot of synergy across the Atlantic now in this. And is what Andrew Morris is doing in Scotland a kind of a forerunner for how you need to proceed? I mean, he's been also collecting these data sets and trying to uh, create standards that, that, that work for opting in. I think the data standardization, interoperability, uh, I could spend an hour talking about data interoperability challenges within one company. And so I can only imagine what it's like within one country and then across 27 states, I think we have our work cut out. But Okay, very good. Um, I'm gonna move on now to our final speaker, Sean Beavers, a senior lecturer in air quality modeling at King's College in London. He's been working on some complex models uh, that involve exposure to pollutants by location, which requires data inputs on how people are moving and where they're spending their time throughout the day. Um, over to you, Sean. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, thank you, everyone. Um, yeah, uh, just to give you some examples of the work that we're doing in London, really. Um, we, we've uh, been undertaking air quality modelling uh, in London for, for many years, and, and primarily it's uh, revolved around policy, so developing things like congestion charge, uh, low emission zones, along with our partners at TfL and, and the, the Gre uh, Greater London Authority. The aim, of course, is to meet EU li uh, limit values for air quality and also to improve people's health. So, um, uh, of course, being a modeler, no one ever believes what you say. Uh, so so uh, th th there's a few choices um, uh, of what you can do about it. And one of the things has been uh, utilizing big data. So uh, but by incorporating uh, more measurements, essentially, within our models, we, 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 can, we can hope to improve um, our predictive capability. So things that we've uh, used within our emissions model, road transport is very important in London, is... Um, We've used GPS to track vehicle speed so that we, we, we know a little bit more about what um, the, co the congestion of vehicles within uh, the area. We use automatic number plate recognition. So there's a lot of these cameras around in London. They, they uh, uh, look at your number plate and they, and they, they can show uh, uh, what kind of vehicle it is, what Euro standard it is. Uh, we, recently, we sort of uh, moved that on so you can actually uh, uh, use that sort of information with uh, it, data sets that give you much more about the vehicle technology, which I think will be important for uh, not only for, uh, for forecasting uh, air pollution emissions, but also things like climate change going forward. And these are critically important for, for, for getting the emissions and the air quality modelling right. Uh, and increasingly, we're using roadside measurements of, uh, of vehicle emissions as well. 
Uh, and these are important because a lot of the emissions models that we, we've been using uh, are based on a, 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 a sort of fairly limited number of tests, often for some vehicle types. And these, uh, these roadside measurements can test thousands of vehicles. You can do it every year uh, and you can get a lot more detail about uh, the actual vehicle. And, and it, I think ultimately it'll lead to better uh, emissions inventories. Um, uh, and and uh, why do we do all of this? Well, obviously we want to get our modelling right, but uh, air quality policy is a very long-term thing. Uh, you know, you want to meet a standard by such and such a day. It may take you know, five or ten years to, to achieve that. Uh, if by year six you've found out that your policy is not really working because you got something wrong when you forecast uh, using your model, you're, you're in real trouble because uh, you, you've now got to come up with a new policy and it's going to take another five years and, and consequently it sort of spirals into the fact that you failed to meet a, a particular standard. Uh, and there are discussions going on in the UK uh, to that effect for NOx uh, right at the moment. Uh, so, so that's one of the things that we've done, and we try to incorporate um, large data sets into our models. But we're also interested in epidemiological research. So we've, we've been looking uh, with, uh, with our colleagues who, who deal with air quality and, epi um, uh, and health outcomes, uh, and, and we've been using our models uh, at the postcode level, essentially, uh, to look at uh, certain outcomes. And I made a list of them because I, I, I can never remember all of them. But the things like uh, our recent uh, work with the uh, MRC NERC funded project traffic, uh, look, look at child, uh, um, child lung function, cardiovascular risk markers, primary care consultations, adverse reproductive outcomes, hospital admissions, acute coronary syndrome uh, um, and mortality uh, and those are the things that they're, they're trying to associate with air quality and, and, and rather than forecasting future which is what you would do with policy you forecast years that have gone by and then they take data sets and join the two all of this uh, I might add is anonymized and we use trusted third parties and so on what, 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 where this is getting the data getting your hands on the I model. wouldn't say no trouble I mean uh, from uh, the policy air quality modeling side of things is easier than the um, the epidemiology and health uh, data, which is much more, much more difficult, and they have to go through uh, numerous ethics approvals. And, but you got it. Huh? You but got we got, it. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well I didn't, but it's, somebody did, and you know, it's a, it's a lot of work for them, so I, I can talk very, in a very blase way about it. Um, <laughs> and, and I might add as well, that, and ethics is a, a really important uh, um, uh, contributor to all of this and, and the safety of the actual data itself because, uh, I mean, two of the things that researchers uh, um, uh, are required to do as part of their jobs is to publish uh, in good, you know, good journal papers uh, and, to, and to get funding. And without ethics, you get neither. So, uh, I mean, it's a real, it's a driver for, for the protection of data. So, uh, but anyway, um, within air pollution epidemiology, we... Um, Often the exposure to air quality is associated with um, the, the location where people live. Now, now obviously, we, we're not at our homes at the moment, and, and we've travelled here on trains and, and various other ways, and people travel around generally. So we're, we're, the, the way in which we've tried to uh, use big data to improve that is we, we now have a, a data set, again, that we got from uh, um, uh, Transport for London, who used it for um, uh, transport planning, uh, of where people uh, spend their time, where they move around, how they, um, the transport mode that they use, when they use it, it be it the tube or the bus, in the car, walking, cycling, and so on. Uh, and combining that with a much more detailed model, which does sort of 20 meter resolution spatially and one hour uh, temporal resolution. So, you, you know, for each pollutant for each year, it's, you know, 70 billion records just for, just for that. So you can see that these things are, are, are quite data intensive. Uh, and, and that's to avoid the potential pitfall of some of the epidemiological research in the past which has, uh, has uh, exposure misclassification. So you, we're not classifying people's exposure properly. And then when you look at the health outcomes, are you, are you really uh, associating the two in a, in a, in a proper way? Now, th this obviously gives us quite a lot of scope for problems. And I, I, so I've noted down some of the, the problems that we have for big, uh, big data concerns, really. Uh, and and um, uh, in our experience, qu quality was top of my list. Uh, and... There's an avalanche of data that you can use, and, and the quality is absolutely essential. Now, if we wanted, to, for example, our, our new sort of model where everyone moves around the urban area to be used by policymakers, we're going to have to convince policymakers that it's real and it's reflective of the population uh, as a whole. And that creates massive problems because how do we actually test whether this movement of people through the urban areas is really what they do? I mean, we've got some data, we've got the timings of trips and so on that we can test. We're using Oyster card data to, to actually do some evaluation. 
Uh, um, but there's, there's, a, there's a massive problem and, and things like full-time GPS in smartphones would be one possible solution where you know, there, there's a, a, a GPS on your phone, you can, leave, you can leave it on all the time. Potentially using those with infrastructure, which would be, a, would be another way uh, of doing it. And also things like auto, you know, automatic number plate recognition data where there's millions and millions of records, again, all anonymized. But we know that some of the database attributes are associated with it uh, uh, that could uh, in, be improved. And so uh, there's, a, there's um, a lot of things that we need to do there. If we're going to make exposure to air pollution very much more specific to individuals, uh, how do we prove that what our model says, after all, no one believes a model, uh, um, we're against measurements? And so this calls into, you know, a, a question, how do you actually um, undertake personal exposure um, at a sort of population level? And that's a real big data challenge, which I think is really quite interesting. And so we, we're going to have to give that some, some thought. Um, the other thing I would say is that... Um, a, a, a little bit of conversation uh, has occurred uh, today about tools. Uh, now, we, um, we produce a lot of our data and give it away. It's on the London Data Store. You can get our 20-meter modeling data. You can get all of our emissions data that we produce through the London Atmospheric Emissions Inventory. And, you know, you can just download it. It's not a problem. And I think the London Data Store itself is important because a lot of the transport stuff and pretty much, you know, lots of data sets associated with London are on there and people can get access to it. So that, that, that's quite useful. But if you are faced by an avalanche of data, in this case air quality or modelling data, how do you actually analyse it? It's very specialist, you have to understand it. Um, and to the layperson, it's almost impossible to do that. So, uh, with that in mind, we've, we've sort of we're developing tools like uh, we've got Open Air, which is a, is a tool which ha uh, uh, you can download uh, free from our website. Uh, you, can, you can use it in conjunction with R, which is a statistics package, but that's freely available. It's open source. So all of it's open source. You can see the code within it, so you can, you can make tests and check things out. Uh, and also a manual which tells you how to, you know, the sorts of examples of how you could actually process the data that we create. So I think that's probably quite a, a useful thing to, uh, to do as well. So... So, so there are some of my problems, but and, and hopefully some, some solutions. solutions. Yeah, yeah well, that's yes. That's very interesting yeah. because yeah. M most people would be interested in whether they're breathing in polluted air. So maybe there's a big opt-in factor for you where people would be happy to give you their data about yeah, their movements. Sure. I mean, we're working on a, um, at the moment on a smartphone um, app which... You know, you point at a location in London, it finds out where you are, and it tells you what the air quality concentration is at that point in time. So uh, those sorts of things, uh, I think, will become... Uh, Question here on the left. <coughs> Thanks, I love that. Uh, I love those, those comments on it. Um, I, I just read a while back on, a, on an interesting application, something uh, that you probably are aware of, but I just wondered if you apply those things as well. Um, this was a little cap that was put on uh, asthma inhalers. Uh, asthma inhalers, and there was put a little cap on it um, for people to locate when they would take a puff at which GPS location. And so this was done in the Boston area, and I, don't, I forgot which, which institute researched the data and set it up. And it was done across the whole, this whole area of Massachusetts, and they found out that many more puffs were taken uh, in the shipping area, in the harbor, particularly at times when there was uh, soy products being, uh, being oh, offloaded, yeah, yeah. which I think is a fantastic example of how a very simple and simple tool on top of an inhaler can actually give us a lot of information on what's happening, and as a result, they adjusted the loading times, the offloading times, and the schedule for, for the soy products. Um, are you thinking of doing those things too? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there, there are other. Um, personally, no, because I'm 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 not directly associated with the health, the, you know, design. But um, I, there are other examples of uh, of the um, for. Uh, that pacemakers, they've actually tested when pacemakers fire and, and those sorts of things. So there are other examples of, of using in-population sort of data to find out where, where you know, it potentially trouble will occur with the health outcome. So, yeah, I mean, it's really, you know, there's anything you can do, really. Just think about it. Okay, I have a question for the panel. Uh, you know, we've heard that culture is an obstacle, communication is an obstacle. I'm convinced once some of these success stories go viral, there will be a huge awakening and some of the blockage on that front will start to evaporate. But w we've got this issue of standards and interoperability and of course privacy. And I'm wondering if we can make some progress uh, uh, 
thinking about what, what's the next step, what needs to happen, and how can it happen on those three issues. Um, does anyone want to tackle that? You can just take one of the three, too. <laughs> Well, I, I think on the interoperability, which um, and I'm obviously only looking at it, and you, you talked about the problems in the company. You try doing it in the university. It's even worse, I think. Um, uh, and we've got to actually set examples about what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. That's going to take a long time to evolve. What's a uh, long time? Uh, I, well, who knows? Um, uh, but, but actually, it almost comes back the other way around. If you can actually show this working, then people will start to find ways of doing it. What we're saying is, only in the RDA, is that you can store your data how you like. That's OK. As long as you make it accessible somehow or other to other people, it doesn't matter when, you know, if you have it down here or up here in your system, <laughs> as long as it becomes accessible. And if you're not going to take part in it, you're out of the action. So I think it's going to, be a, it's going to take some while. One of the obstacles there is, I hate to say it, academic supervisors who uh, really don't understand what's going on. Um, uh, I mean, yeah, it was only because I was dumped into this by, you know, uh, from scratch. It was totally naive that it became abundantly obvious what you could do. But if you're not exposed to that, you're not going to do it. How do you release the young scientists, the young researchers to, to actually absorb this? So I think it will take some time, but I think if we can show these examples of it working, people will want to do it. Now, there are a lot of people, and as I said, in my Woods Law, at least one third won't share anything. <coughs> Let's accept it and, and stop trying to persuade them. You know, that'll be a crash course in universities for... Uh, oh, I could tell you. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I've, I've worked in six, so... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, about Sean. 20 years ago, we, we set up the London Air Quality Network, and, and this one of the problems, well, we had two major problems. Were, were people were making measurements of air quality in all sorts of different ways, using all sorts of different quality. Um, and, um, and also the data was kept in sort of proprietary software, which was designed by the people who sold them the instruments to do it. And so what, what the things that we did was we actually went ahead and wrote a manual saying, look, if you're going to measure air quality, measure it in this particular way. If you want to measure the road, measure it like this. If you want to measure a background or suburban or rural, measure it in this particular way. Make sure the quality is right, so ensure that your QAQC function is right. And then we, we developed a thing that we called Monet, which basically contacted each of these sites and, um, and parsed the data from all sorts of different formats into just a standard format and then just handed it out so you can get it on the, uh, on the web. And that's, uh, you know, 20 years later, we're still around. So, I mean, it can't have been that bad, I suppose. Uh, so, so, I mean, that's how, uh, you know, our, our, our sort of solution, I suppose, to some of those problems. is It can be overcome. Okay. Kenny, do you have any sure thoughts? This is <clears throat> directly relevant to the, to the, to the privacy, but it's, it's actually a, a challenge to Thierry a little bit about um, the, the funding, and we talked about this a little bit earlier, about the funding for multi multidisciplinary systematic machine learning approaches, because the, the science and technology is universal, the funding is very local. Mm -hmm. And, and that, is, that is a problem, is that academics, and here I will, I mean, I was an academic, uh, um, academic scientists there is a tendency to to go safe if you want if you look at the kinases for example in the human body there are, there are over 500 kinases the vast majority of publications and grant money is on 10 percent of them hmm. and, and this has been published uh, and, and promoted by a number of a number of groups and it's been widely seen and then if you actually look at the and sad to say company activity company investment 10 years later in company patents follows the same pattern so you're neglecting a vast majority of potential genes which could be involved in human disease. But it's, it, it's nothing to do with privacy, but it's something to do, it's a challenge to how we, in Horizon 2020, I think, open up and try to move scientists from a, a very local perspective to a more a perspective on funding which matches the globalization of the science. It's a slightly different angle. Comments, questions? Here's one in the front. Uh, hello, my name is Elena Dipcina and I'm from Research Council of Norway. And I have a question to the panel. And uh, do you think that um, uh, quality assurance of the data isn't an obstacle? And how we will decide, like, this data is old-fashioned or up-to-date that we are using, especially when it is in data depositories or something like this? Well. There is one aspect uh, in this uh, question is, 
is, I mean, it's not enough to store data. It's to store also to have access on the way they were collected. So in fact, there is also one step further that, uh, I mean, if you go very far, you, you have also the tools and methods uh, on how the data would be processed to get results. So it's a whole process which has to be more transparent and that uh, uh, there is an aspect which was mentioned in the previous panel is accountability. And uh, um, then uh, uh, also in the academic uh, world, uh, uh, I think, if we do not provide the right incentives to the researchers on, let's say, the data quality, on the need to uh, clean their data, to maintain their data, we will go nowhere. I think there is a process there. If there is no reward, it's not by imposing regulation that which you will change anything. Well, so, uh, who, who should impose that quality control, Thierry? Well, uh, I think... First, I, the best quality control is by the citizens at large. By it's, it, 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 it's uh, it, I mean, citizen, when I say by peers or uh, exposing the way you collect data. Mm. I mean, and this is precisely also <laughs> one, uh, one element of uh, uh, you need to open, to give access to your data in order that also the underlying assumptions you have made can be checked. Mm. I mean, all that is the full process. And... Uh, certainly, what is determinant, I think our society is also changing. I mean, the, the society at large is asking for much more transparency. And in pharmaceutical area, it's, uh, it's de facto a must. But if you take uh, genetically modified organisms also, it's not possible that we, we, we go on the way we go, where you have uh, uh, results being published and the underlying data are not accessible. I think this is not acceptable, and I mean, and society will more and more reject that. Yeah, especially for data reuse is something that we're hearing about the, the reuse, and then the quality becomes even more imperative, obviously. Yeah, John. Yeah, I think linked with that is the whole area of trust uh, um, of who's done what, because now when we're going global, um, and it goes back to the spice boats a bit here. Uh, I, until recently, was on the uh, a director of an academic publisher, and the amount of plagiarism that's going on is phenomenal, far greater than you think. Uh, and when certain, um, uh, certain countries and certain universities give financial rewards for publications linked to data, you suddenly realise where the incentives are <laughs> going. And I think there, the whole area of... Uh, a personal persistent identifier that you actually know that that person is that person and you can go back and interrogate that person mm. rather than some anomalous group it, it, it is one of the things. Now, there was a lot of resistance to that because people want to have, you know, they don't want to be pointed at. And, and that's another barrier, how we actually do that. Um, and I signed up straight away. That's mainly because I've stopped doing my own research, so it doesn't really matter to me. But, but, but I actually think it's quite important that if you're a serious researcher, you've got to say, I'm prepared to share my personal, you know, uh, uh, on that dot on the map, uh, and there are certain areas of the world where there are lots of common names, <laughs> often with one or two letters by the time they can't do English. But we've had the same problem in, in the UK. There's plagi plagiarism happens, mm -hmm. uh, and you need to know that. So the, it goes back to this quality issue, but it, it's about trust and how you build trust in. And you don't, as Thierry says, you don't do it by regulation. You've got to do it by other ways. And, mm -hmm. and that's, a, that's, a, that's a big obstacle. And again, it goes back to this... Um, personal stuff as well. What are you prepared to share? Um, there are things like ORCID, which I, I, I know the, the commissioner uh, are supporting, which is one of the persistent identifiers you can use, uh, personal identifiers. And then you've got to have the persistent identifiers for the actual data so that you actually know it hasn't been corrupted. Uh, and I, I mean, I, I'm also on the advisory board of the British Library. They check their digitized data three times a day by going round uh, to three locations. You know, that, that ha that's the sort of thing you have to do to make sure it's safe. I don't know how you sleep at night with this huge universe of, oh, <laughs> sort I, of problems yeah. to solve, but, uh, to get data organized and structured and trustful. Uh, well, and I don't. <laughs> I just talk about it, so it's easy for me. Okay. But, uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, let me just tell you this one story. Uh, small, well, I think the square kilometer array, which is going to be one of these big data generators, about 600 or plus 15 meter uh, telescopes across half the southern hemisphere, looking at the <laughs> night sky. 
or the, or the southern sky. They, they, I, I've forgotten what the exact number was. They can detect a radio signal to tell you whether a plane will be delayed, uh, I don't know how many million light years away. So that's the sort of thing that I, I think about okay. and, uh, and inspires me. <laughs> uh, we have a question up here, uh, Dwayne. Just okay, next So Stefan Berkman's Elsevier. Just a quick comment to John. So you know about uh, for the, pla uh, the plagiarism and the investment that publishers are making. Uh, there are different um, tools being implemented right now. One is called CrossCheck, of course, plagiarism, but also ORCID that address right away the actual unique ID for all the researchers in the world so you can track actually specifically, you're, you're not tracking now based on the name, you're actually tracking based on an ID. And there was, so there's a lot of, uh, you know, of tools that are starting to be implemented. One thing I can think of is all the data that's brought now through uh, the web availability of articles with, for example, Article of Future. You can have data that's embedded in there and available, and that can be reused, rechecked. And there's a new development coming that's going to be really interesting where you can actually start playing with the data and change it to see and adapt it to your experiments and, and play with it and see graphs, et cetera, changing based on that. So I think that's going to be r very useful and quite, quite important for quality, actually. Yeah, I, I, did, I was just talking about ORCID, which I do believe in quite a lot. Uh, and these software tools are being developed, but even so, there are still quite a lot getting through sometimes. Um, uh, but I know what Elsevier are doing, as you know. I, uh, in fact, yesterday's meeting was about publishers and data um, in, in Oxford, where a lot of this stuff was being discussed. I think we've got a long way to go, but it, it's certainly one of the big issues, especially in certain countries which have got monetary rewards based on the sharing of data. Down in the front, Dwayne. <clears throat> Thank you very much. John Crawford, IBM. I wonder whether we have to do some more work on how to, um, how to visualize a lot of this information for the general public's benefit. So, you know, we're quite used to the idea of going on to eBay and looking at the trustworthiness of, of our buyers or sellers, or going on to, for example, in the UK, we have Crime Map, where you can go and look at, you know, outbreaks of crime in your area and, and avoid the high crime streets. Um, do we have to think a little bit harder then about um, how to uh, get some of these big data <coughs> insights, which otherwise would just become single headlines in the newspaper, and turn them into navigational tools that allow us to make better decisions about public health, about uh, travel options, and about um, avoiding risk? Spreading awareness. Yes. Very effective way to do it virally. Well, the risk of uh, talking too much, I mean, the whole area of crowdsourcing and citizen cyber science, I think, is where this is. That's when I go back to culture, that you ought to be starting to do this very early on, that you, you start interrogating these data. Uh, and, of course, this has uh, immense implications for democracy, because suddenly you have the same data as the person making the decision. And I know there are some examples around the world where the citizens have got hold of the data and changed the political decision. Um, and this is quite frightening in many ways. I mean, I can tell you one thing that... that, that it, be good. It, well, that this is, you know, I, well, I think it's good, but, um, that, but on the other hand, it can be manipulated. If somebody takes selectively data and misuses it, then you've got another problem on your hands. But can I tell you, this is from my own organization. One of the big issues that's cropped up it is the mobile telephone in Africa, um, in that, if I tell you, in southern South Africa, only 30% of the academic staff have a PhD, and by the time you get to Malawi, it's 4%. Students are accessing data on their telephones during a lecture and asking questions to the, to the academic who can't answer. And that is actually proving a big social issue. So there is another side to it. Um, but I think, I think it's a very exciting thing. Um, I think we've got a long way to go, but I, I, I'm with you here. The more we can get this is part of the cultural thing. Um, but so you know how certain newspapers take certain data and manipulate them, and it's a very, very big risk. I think in medicine as well, mm. that information asymmetry now for mm. the well-informed patient going to his mm. physician, usually armed with more information on, that, on, on his or her specific condition, and, and that is fundamentally going to change the, the course of medicine and, and, the, and the practice of, of medicine. That's I'm taking Watson sure. with me next time. Watson. <laughs> 
Okay, we're up in the last five minutes of this panel session, and um, I'd like to give anyone who has a burning question a chance. A quick question, please. One in the front row here and one in the back. <clears throat> John Parkinson, I just wonder whether you'd make comment on the fact that there seem to be certain data protection commissioners over Europe who have a very enlightened attitude to this all, in that there are two sides to data protection. There is one protecting the individual, but there is also, related to <clears throat> data hugging, groups of people who prevent the use of data by saying, <clears throat> I can't do that under the Data Protection Act. And some of the commissioners have at last come out and said, that is just as illegal as misuse of the data. And I think it's something we should be congratulating those particular ones for doing, and I'd like your comments, thank you. Good point, thank you. Well, one can't but accept that, that's a, that's a great idea. Yeah. It was a question uh, there. Just a comment that unless you make the, I mean, I'm talking about data generated by human beings, unless you make the person who generate the data a stakeholder of the outcome of those data, big data analysis. You can go on cleaning and cleaning and looking for provenance, but it doesn't change the fact that the human who's generating it could really be one having incentives to generate garbage. For example, I work with a few startups who's absolutely wanting to help me make sure that Google gets garbage. And they tell me, make sure you do crossword puzzle and search for your answers on Google then they don't know what you're really searching for because you're searching for crossword answers. And they come up with all sorts of tricks to teach us how to create gar garbage in terms of data. Now, this is only a very small bit about Google search and things like that. But unless someone tells me who's generating data that there is, I have a stake in whatever that's going to come out of my data through the long tail, etc., etc., we can spend a lot of money cleaning and looking for quality. Any views on that? I, I think the first thing is that um, you're not going to prevent misuse. You've got to accept it. One, one thing I went on many years ago about, for, um, uh, <coughs> about I'm a material scientist, uh, about the um, fraudulent use of materials, was that I didn't think like a, a criminal. And I think actually we start to do, uh, I'm sure in IBM they have people who think like criminals to, to actually think through what, what can go wrong. Um, on the other hand, no, that is not the reason for not doing it. You know, otherwise, we just stop living because, uh, you know, uh, uh, but I think there will be lots of things we haven't thought about which will come about as a result of all this, and we'll have to look at them when we come along. I, I could not believe when I was in charge of the Rutherford Appleton Lab in Oxford how many hits on our firewall a day there were from people trying to corrupt data. And a lot of that was structural biology data. And I used to say to vice chancellors, if that data is corrupted and you are personally responsible for it because the, the, the conditions of the grant are that the university is long-term responsible for these data and a drug company uses those data to do some field trials and you have thalidomide on your hands, what are you going to do about it? I, you've never seen so many faces go white when you say that sort of thing. But I think those are the sort of things we need to start thinking about because I'm sure the company wouldn't just take the data and use it like that. They, they would interrogate it and go further. But uh, there are certain things like that. You can just see worst-case scenarios. And I think we need to look at those as well. Um, but I don't, I don't think like a criminal, so I'm not so good at thinking of that. Yes, Kenny. To go back to the, to the second last comment, um, and, and try and strike that balance between the, 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 the rights of a private individual and the, the benefits of population data. And, and I think it speaks to some extent to the, to the, the contentious right to be forgotten. Because as, as Andrew Morris mentioned uh, earlier, I think we have, to be, we have to raise to the awareness of the Commission the potential unintended collateral damage which can happen, not just to individuals. Take, for example, an individual who opts, who, who takes their, deletes their data, and then there's a, a car crash or something. Then, then there's a situation in which the healthcare providers cannot provide the right access, they cannot provide the right treatment, they don't know the, the medical history of the patient. So I think the public needs to be reminded of what that consequence could be, number one. And then maybe more from a, 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 the perspective of, of, of drug development and the pharma industry, I think also this 
really impedes the potential benefit of longitudinal studies. Uh, some of the things I talked about under EMIF, these longitudinal studies looking at obesity, looking at uh, Alzheimer's and disease reclassification for ultimately a better targeting of, disease, uh, of, of medicines. If uh, people delete their data, then we lose, the, the data richness goes down and down and down if, if all of that is taken out. And the second unintentional potential collateral damage is over restrictions on the use of pseudonymized data. We want to make sure that anonymized data and, and pseudonymized or key coded data are not subject to the full panoply of restrictions because the key coding should, protect, should be sufficient protection in itself. So there's just a couple of things which I think there probably need to be more put into the public domain. Okay, well, we're <clears throat> just about out of time. I'm sorry about that, but you may also continue your discussions in the uh, cocktail reception that follows. And I want to thank our panelists and maybe ask them one last question, which is, it has been a broad ranging discussion, but if you have a kind of a takeaway thought on the obstacles and perhaps solutions for uh, big data applications, what, what would that one uh, takeaway thought be? Maybe starting from Sean's side of the table. Oh, but <laughs> can we start the other end? <laughs> <laughs> um, Anyone who wants to. I mean, I mean, it opens up a, a massive, massive potential benefit for, for, for all of us, really. And I think probably um, the thing that's going to limit um, uh, use of a lot of this data is um, a lot of people's imagination and how you actually go about using it. Uh, and, and that's probably one, uh, one major limiting factor. That speaks to the, yeah, the big educational issue. And well, uh, it, well <coughs> any, anything, just people's imagination and potentially skill as well. Okay. I would say, f from, a, from a biomedical perspective, um, this whole aspect of uh, not being hypothesis driven, that, that the questions will present themselves now from the data. Uh, I think that's gonna, that is transforming the questions we ask in terms of diseases and, and approaches towards disease. The, the, the idea of a hypothesis driven uh, approach, it's basically gone. It's, it's the, with, with all of the technologies now, we can interrogate the, the, the clinical data of the of the populations and the citizenry and, and try to to move from there so I, I see huge benefits i do see risk and i do see the, the necessity for balance but I, I see huge opportunity okay thank you thierry uh, i think i will not really answer the question I, I i would more call upon the audience i mean i have seen a very good will of people and uh, uh, very balanced arguments on on actually uh, making more openness in, uh, in, uh, in, in data. And I think I will call upon you, in fact, to, to support us in developing our pilots because, I mean, basically, we get always all the good reasons to do nothing. And this is not an option. So we need now all the good reasons to progress. And of course, it's not to progress in the wide <laughs> We, we heard a lot of, uh, of points which are absolutely valid on privacy, on, on uh, uh, some type of protections, on quality of data. But these are more things that have to be addressed in a pilot to, uh, in order that we are able to shape our ultimate policy and to develop the right incentives for everybody to make it more open. Challenges, but not yeah. impossible ones. John? Well, there are many, many, but um, uh, and one is that I'm too old to start it all again, which is one of the key inhibiting factors. Um, I would say, and I think this is more of a practical thing, um, and it goes back, I think, to what was a, from the previous session. We've got to develop this new profession of people who are able to move in this space. Yeah. Now, in our report, Riding the Wave, which we did for the European Commission, we, took, we call them data scientists. One thing is that and I, I love librarians, but they're not librarians. And they're not the researchers. They're people who are innovators in this new space. Um, one thing, uh, it, uh, we had a meeting a few weeks ago in the UK about funding in this area. And all these universities came along and said, yes, we, 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 we've got the data management plan now. And I said, but what are you doing with it? No, no, we've got the data management plan. Uh, and, I, I said, you, and I said, why are you doing it? That's because research councils have told us to. And you think, and I said, look, this is about a new exciting way of doing science and doing innovation. 
And there's a sort of blank look. No, we've done the innovation, you know, the, the, the management plan. Uh, we've ticked the box. We've put it in a box and it's okay. Uh, and, and I don't know how we train these people and how we actually reward them. And I think that's going to be one of the key issues because they're going to sit uncomfortably within the normal academic environment. That's in for the academics. I don't know whether they sit w well within the, 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 the um, industrial environment. That's another matter. These people are going to be very difficult to manage. I hope they are anyway. Okay, well, a big round of applause. Thank you all very much. <laughs>